Welcome everybody, you're watching Mr. Fugu Data Science. Today we're going to do our first video for SKLearn, otherwise known as Scikit-Learn. We're using a logistic regression for some binary classification today. Here's the website where you can grab this data set. We're going to have a lot of imports, all right? But before we get started, thank you to the new subscribers and viewers. I greatly appreciate it. Feel free to pause the video if you want to follow along. because we have quite a bit of imports. We're calling in the web page that has our data right here. We're using the request to pull that data. Here's the file that we're going to receive after we make that request. And we're going to need to do a with open statement with a write binary. We're going to write the file that we called with a request here. If you use a bash command, such as this to find all the zip files, we can do that and figure out what permissions we have for this file check if the file that we're going to have actually was downloaded and then it'll give the date and time and how large the file is. Now since this is a zip file we're going to have to use something similar to the with open we did above but use the zip commands here to call in our file what we're going to read and we're going to extract everything into what we're calling as data. After we do that, you can list everything that's within your new folder or directory, and you're going to see that this is available. You can run a separate bash command to get the top 10 lines for these data to see what it looks like. What we're dealing with today are basically messages, SMS messages, and we're determining if it's a spam message or if it's called ham, which is just a regular message. These are thrown into a data frame and the separator you're using is a tab where we're labeling our two columns as your label and the actual message that was thrown in, which was here, okay? So now we have to do some cleaning and using natural language processing to deal with these data. The workhorse for this portion is a normal flow that you would use. We've done in prior instances of NLP, but if this is your first time seeing any of this, we're converting all of our strings into lowercase. Then we're converting each one of our sentences, which is a string, into word list. We're removing useless words such as it, the, etc. And we have to remove punctuation. At your discretion, you can use different types of lamentizers to deal with word endings. Now we need to make a side note. A list comprehension is used here because it's faster than using regular looping. But if you want further speed up, if you had a lot of data, consider using NumPy arrays instead. So we're using this English stop word here. These are the lamentizers that we're calling in. And we establish a function allowing us to return our lemmatized tokens, which are our words instead of sentences. So we do a few things. Here's our lowercase. Here's what we're using to convert our messages into tokens. We're using our first list comprehension that's taking our tokens. And if it's not in our stop words, throw it into our list comprehension and store it. The same exact thing. Remove everything that's not in the string punctuation. And then let's take our clean data and run it through the lemmatizer. Now we're using an apply function taking this function above on the particular column of message from our data frame. And we're going to create a new column here. And here's what our data looks like after you remove the punctuation and all the other junk that was in there. Okay. I created a NumPy array with an if else statement here. If it's ham, convert it to a one. Otherwise, it's zero and that's your spam. This will be used for our Y. We're going to create our X string now where we're taking our cleaned messages and just doing a string join based on spaces and taking all those values. Then do our train test split. And there's a few things going on with this. One, if you don't have enough data, you're gonna have problems with your accuracy. That's the first thing. But also, if you do your train test split with a value that's extremely small, here we're using 30%. Usually people do 20. Just depends on how much data you have and you could test between 20 and 30, you know. For instance, if you made this an extremely small number, you'd have issues with your accuracy later. Also, if you want to retain the same results each time, you need to run a random state, similar to if you're running a random seed within our studio. Also, I would suggest you notice one thing. When we scroll down, and we evaluate these in just a second, you're going to notice something. So we had originally 5,572 rows, and we did a 30% split on our train test. Okay, that's fine. What our actual parameters look like that we're splitting on. So here's our X train, and here's our Y train. Pay attention here. This is already converted into our binary. These will need to get converted next. Okay, so we need to take our messages and do a conversion. 
but I wanted you to notice something. The order of these is not retained on purpose by default with an sklearn. If you would like to retain the order of your arrays, then you'd have to change the default setting, which is normally true to false, but it's used in order to help prevent creating relationships or any kind of artifacts within your data later. So it's kind of like a preventative measure. Now we're going to convert our X train and our X test into the binary vectors that we have for our Y that we already did. That's why we're going to use this count vectorizer here, where it's going to convert our list or your NumPy array of text documents into a matrix of tokens. And the dimensions will be the same, okay, as your vocabulary, and it'll keep account of the words. So if you noticed here, we're doing an analyzer equal to a word. We didn't change these parameters into here. And you have a few things. One, you could change the max features. So the number of features that you're evaluating, we didn't put that here, but that's one option you have. And the minimum number for your DF, that's another thing that you could also change that comes up quite often, all right? It's something I would suggest you look into. Since we're dealing with words, one of these n-grams is another input parameter that I would suggest you look into as well. After we put in our X train, you'll notice that we have this many stored elements. For our testing data, we have this many, pretty much a third less. So what do we do with this now? We're running this in our count vectorizer, but what do we do? We need to now put this into our logistic regression, okay? There's a few things we need to take note of. In this case, I'm using CV equals five, which is gonna be our cross-validation or K folds. You have to remember that when you're using K folds, you're going to have K minus one folds where one fold is going to be held out when you do this, okay? And you're basically shuffling each time and holding out one to do your comparison against. And the result that you're basically looking for will be your accuracy here. And this would be your performance of how your average cross-validation was scored for that particular loop and you're basically running through this five times for your train test split or it's doing a split for each one of these folds in a different location and let's look at this okay let's look at the data which is for sk learn so you can get an idea of what's going on let's look at sk learn so you can get an idea of what's going on with your train test split so we have these five folds the first fold we have here, which is held out. Here's our data. Then the second time, it's going to shuffle in a different location for our holdout. And the same will go down through these. Okay. Your test data are never used within your training. So you have something to compare against later that wasn't manipulated or affect any of your results. Now the model will try to make our training data and generate a fit based on what we provide. And after this step, you're taking your unseen test data that was withheld initially and check the accuracy of the labeling of ham and spam. For instance, if we had in this case, we'll generate 98.5% correctly labeling ham versus spam, which you'll see in a second. You have to also consider over and underfitting. If you get in a particular situation where you're getting extremely close to the training accuracy, you got an issue. For instance, in this case, you would have overfitting, which means that you need to do some changes to your data for your model. Since above, we created our Y and converted that into a NumPy array. I'm recasting this as just an integer. And here we're getting into our logistic regression part, which is part of our SK learning we called it above. Here's our five folds that we're going to use, iterating 200 times. And here we're doing a scoring for accuracy. Most people use accuracy, but there's times when you don't want to use this. And I'll explain that soon. So when you do your fitting for a logistic regression, you print this off where we're taking our X train and our Y train, and this is what it actually looks like. And you have a bunch of parameters that you can change, okay? And the, here's where they are. You could change the penalty, you could change the scoring, you could change the solver. These are things you should look at for doing tuning within your model. Here, our train is pretty much one. Okay, fine. Let's look at three different ways of getting the accuracy for our test data. But what really is the accuracy? It's taking the number of correctly labeled observations divided by your total observations. Well, these are our correctly labeled, your true positive and true negatives, divided by everything. And there's situations where this isn't really wanted. Here's one, notable. 
exception. If you have a situation where your false positives or your false negatives are pretty close in the number of them, like equaling each other throughout your data, then I would consider changing to an F1 score because it's more robust and it takes into the account of the false negatives and false positives. It gives a ratio or a weighted value of the precision and your recall, which we'll describe coming up. So you can do this regular score right here, producing our accuracy, where you're just taking the value that we called for a CLF, which equals our logistic regression parameters. You call scoring and you throw in your X and Y test. You can also get the same value calling in from SKLR metrics, the accuracy score. But this is a little different because you call the accuracy score, you call in the CLF that we created, and you do a predict on your X test for the variable cross-validation that we stored and then you have to call in your Y test. You can also do this by hand which is shown here where we're still taking the predicted value but we're taking the probability of the predicted value. Have to pay attention to the axis that you're using and we're getting the value equal to the Y test. We're summing everything up and we're taking the max value and dividing it by all Y test. This one's a little complicated and confusing but it illustrates what's going on actually. We can now get our precision recall and F1 scores as well. The precision is the ratio predicted positive observations to the total positive observations. Okay. Recall is dealing with sensitivity. It's looking for the correctly predicted positive observations relative to all observations in the actual class. But what does that even mean? You're taking all the true positives. All right. That's right here in the denominator. And you're saying for all my true positives divided by all positives. So true positives and false negatives. And that sounds kind of goofy, but you'll see below in the table we have to illustrate what's going on but I need to illustrate a few points. If you had a bank and it was looking at fraud detection and you predicted a particular instance to be negative when indeed it was actually positive, you would have an issue. And what happens if you also had something like some kind of virus, for instance, and you accidentally predict that a sick person is not sick, but indeed healthy? given some test. But this would be extremely bad if this is a highly contagious disease. Because in fact, what you would be doing is saying that this false negative is true when it's not. And the F1 score is something that's difficult to actually explain. But what it's doing is it's taking a weighted average of the recall and the precision. So you're doing two times the recall and precision divided by the sum of the recall and the precision. And then we have something called the support. That's not exactly what's going on with this here, because this would infer that we have a ratio. And indeed, we have the actual values represented from what we're evaluating against for our test set. So what we have here is the precision recall F1 score and the ham equals one and the spam equals zero. So the precision, they're the exact same. The recall on the other hand is 91% and the F1 score is 95%. And those are what we should be investigating and trying to interpret from these data. Because is this the best solution for solving this kind of problem? Maybe not. So the outcome would suggest that we have a 98.5% accuracy, meaning that for our data, we correctly predicted 98.5% of the predicted observations divided by the total observations. The precision, on the other hand, says that we have 99% for both cases, meaning that we correctly predicted the positive observations divided by the total predicted positive observations. The recall suggests that we have 91% percent that were predicted for spam, meaning that true positives were correctly predicted 91% of the time using logistic regression. And the F1 score showed that 95% of the time was correctly labeling our data given that we took into account the false positives and false negatives. Now, there are different ways that you can have set this problem up for labeling. Instead of doing how I did it for labeling, you, you could have did something different. And I would highly suggest running this and doing other comparisons such as like trees, using multinomials, things like this to get an idea of how it matches up with these results to see if you could make a better model. Also do some tuning, like I mentioned earlier in the video. Let's do a comparison and look at 
opposite our actual values to our predicted values and see how this lines up. So for instance, this row was misguided and looked like it was actually correct when indeed it was spam. That happened with this one and these two here. You'd have to look and investigate and see what's going on with these to get a further analysis of why this was incorrectly labeled. But that's the whole thing with doing this kind of analysis is trial and error, okay? But I would like to say please like, share, and subscribe. And if you subscribe, turn on the notification bell. I hope this brought you to lead to someone. Don't forget to go on my Twitter or Instagram and I set up a buy me a coffee. I know, shameless plug, but I spend a lot of time on these videos. I'd greatly appreciate it if you could help support this channel. Thanks a lot. See you in the next one. Bye.